Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison. I want to welcome you to this session of Humanity Rising. As we begin our third of five programs on the theme that China is not our enemy. Uh, when we started uh, in our first session, uh, we provided an overview of the general situation as it pertains to the escalating tensions between the United States and China. Uh, in our second program, we looked at some of the geostrategic realities of the Chinese situation uh, and the Pacific Rim. And what was startling, I think, for almost all of us is to learn that the reality is virtually the opposite of what we're being told. And this brings us today to arguably uh, the most important session of our week, and that is the session on propaganda. Propaganda is the essential foundation and container for war. And within this context, it's worth just recalling one of the great insights of Voltaire. Voltaire, uh, who was around for the French Revolution, said that if you can get me to believe absurdities, you can get me to commit any kind of atrocity. And that is at the heart of the power of propaganda, because whoever shapes our narratives, whoever develops the storyline that we believe to be true, can get us to do almost anything based on what we think is really happening out there in the world. So the shaping of mass media, the controlling of who speaks and who does not speak is an essential um, criterion for the preparation of the public uh, for war. One of the great breakthroughs in propaganda uh, happened in the 1930s uh, with the Nazis. You're all familiar with Joseph Goebbels and uh, Adolf Hitler's mastery of propaganda. And what they learned and what they executed with amazing power was what they called the big lie. That the most effective propaganda is not just simply slight distortions of the truth. The most effective propaganda is when you actually turn the truth on its head. And if you've read uh, George Orwell's uh, 1984, uh, that is what he talks about as the uh, essential methodology of the ministry of truth. You take a lie, you call it truth, and you bombard the public without ceasing until they have no other alternative but to believe that that is the case. And once that's accomplished, you can get them to do virtually anything. And we've seen it time and time again uh, over the decades since the Second World War, uh, as both the uh, communist nations and the capitalist nations refine the instrumentality of uh, propaganda, uh, but most particularly the mastery was exercised by the United States, uh, which has been in perpetual war uh, for the last uh, 75 years, and therefore has refined the instrumentality of propaganda uh, to a level of sophistication that is quite extraordinary. And we can't unpack it all today in, in this session, uh, the issue of propaganda warrants its own five-day program. Uh, but we're going to touch on it uh, today. 
um, through a number of, of um, uh, vantage points. Uh, and we'll continue the conversation over the next couple of days and then in subsequent programs. Uh, but as we look at the news, when you're watching BBC, when you're watching CNN or MSNBC or uh, uh, Deutsche uh, Telekom or uh, any of the mainstream news uh, outlets, entertain the notion that what you're being told, particularly about Ukraine and very specifically about China, is the opposite of what's actually taking place. And it's our failure to understand that that constitutes the major part of our predicament in discerning truth uh, from falsehood. The propagandists are very good at what they do. It's within the spirit that I want to thank uh, Jody Evans, uh, the co-founder of Code Pink, who is the uh, co-moderator this week with me. And uh, Code Pink is co-sponsoring with Humanity Rising and Ubiquity University uh, this program on China, as it has previous uh, summits on Ukraine. Uh, so, Jody, thank you so much for a stellar group of uh, presenters so far, and I'm uh, very excited to have uh, the presenters today on the uh, domain of propaganda. I turn the program over to you. Thank you, Jim, and thanks for that introduction. That was awesome. Um, I, I don't have to do anything now. You know, I... I I want to remind everyone that, uh, you know, Monday I said that I started this campaign because what I saw and heard was that it sounded just like what was happening at the beginning of the, you know, what the drive to the Iraq war was, which was lies and hate. Um, so, you know, inside of propaganda, we're also driven to hate which um, we're paying the price of because it has literally ripped up the shreds of the culture, the connectivity of society here in the United States. So we can't be surprised at where we find ourselves. Um, so yes, welcome to our day three. Um, yesterday was so full of information and humanity when we took that deeper dive into China. And as I said, it was rather shallow, but um, I left with such, such so full of, of beauty. Um, so I'm very excited that again today we have Mika back um, to talk to us about the propaganda piece. Um, you know, and, and I'm so grateful to Mika because it, I think what it helps us see is what, um, what this looks like from somewhere else, from not our own minds. And um, it's, it's hard to really sit with that your mind has been manipulated for a very long time. And just living in an empire is its own manipulation that um, we need to be aware of because it means we don't think like the rest of the world. There's a laziness to our thinking. There are assumptions and, and it has a, a kind of greed inside of it um, and a, a hubris. And so, you know, I really encourage you to open your mind and listen because when we live inside of an empire, um, that exceptionalism that we buy into flattens our thinking. And um, think, you know, think about that. But in that flattening of the thinking, it makes us easier to manipulate. So um, for those of you that weren't with us yesterday, I just want to introduce Mika again, because she's quite amazing. She's an educator and a researcher and part of the Pan-Africanism Today Secretariat which coordinates the regional articulation of the International People's Assembly, check that out, and is also part of the No Cold War Coordination Committee, a peace platform promoting multilateralism and maximum global co cooperation, of which Code Pink is a member. 
She's also part of Dongshen, an international collective of researchers interested in Chinese politics and society, and hosts The Crane, an Africa-China podcast. So I turn it over to you, Mika. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you so much, Jody, and thank you for the hosts um, of this program for allowing us to have these very necessary um, and urgent discussions, uh, and particularly in the moment that we're sitting in. So I'm going to jump straight in, and what I want to raise is when we're talking about propaganda, we have to understand it as part of what some call the soft power, you know, landscape and apparatus that even though it's called soft power in kind of political realist theory, it has a lot of hard elements because soft power is considered, you know, it's about persuasion or co-option at most, but not necessarily as coercive as soft power. I mean, as hard power, when in fact, it has a lot of um, hard power elements and coercive elements to it. So I want to talk about U.S. soft power and its role in African and specifically South African media and what's, you know, has been called the propagandistic um, policies it's had. But before that, I can just say, you know, very openly, we always have to ask the question on who controls the media and what interest lies behind their control. If you look in the case of South Africa, for example, the biggest and almost monopolistic control of the media landscape in South Africa is in a company called NASPERS. And NASPERS was founded in 1915 as um, the, basically the media infrastructure for the nationalist Afrikaner party. So basically the white supremacist um, colonial settlers who then in 1948 would become the leaders of South Africa and initiate what we know as apartheid. So the richest, uh, one of the richest South African media moguls basically inherited a media apparatus that was founded on principles based on white supremacy, racial segregation, and uh, class division. So that infrastructure doesn't just because, you know, we've moved into a quote unquote more democratic period, the foundations of that infrastructure doesn't change the fact that they are implicit in its structure, forms of inequality, forms of prejudice, and that it made its wealth largely through, you know, racial exploitation and class exploitation of the working class masses in South Africa. But that's one that in, in Africa, if we, aside from um, kind of smaller, groups owned by some Africans, the major ones come out of a historical inheritance of colonial media infrastructure. So that's more endogenous. But broadly speaking, the likes of BBC, um, France 24, Euronews, various forms of US media still largely control directly or indirectly um, the mainstream media cycle in Africa. So, for example, there is a, a big syndication platform called Africa News, and it's largely owned by a French company um, that operates through the Euro News Syndicate. So when we are looking at and using that kind of media, which I go to it just to check out what some of the media highlights is, but implicit in their reporting is a vision of the world and an understanding of politics that serves a certain type of interest, particularly a Western ideological and hegemonic um, interest. So that's just the media landscape broadly because you can't understand how we receive and conceptualize our relationship with China without understanding that the media landscape is entirely under a Western monopoly, whether it's financially or discursively, it's steeped in a long history of being controlled um, by Western powers and historically colonial Western powers. But jumping to the present, in terms of soft power, media basically operates to further US foreign policy interests. So what are those US foreign policy interests right now? 
last year in November, December, early December, we saw the US hosted the US Africa Leaders Summit. And in January, we saw, I think it was like January and between January and March, we saw four high level US government representatives visiting Africa, including US Vice President Kamala Harris, who had a trip in March. And with all of this, we're kind of seeing a new scramble or re, I want to call it a scramble, but a, a scrambling for Africa after the kind of vacuum that the Trump administration left, as many of you know, he called Africa a continent of shithole countries, something on the, along those lines. So during his uh, period of administration, basically Africa was put on the back burner. But with the increasing relationships and, and um, collaboration that we've seen between the African continent and China, and we spoke about this yesterday, that you know, China's now Africa's biggest bilateral trader, a third of the energy sector has been created by Chinese fin financing and construction. There are a lot of different forms of bilateral trade relationships that range from infrastructure to healthcare, to energy, to um, transportation, et cetera. So in the last, since 2000, when the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation was established, we've seen two decades of a skyrocketing in the relationship between the African continent and China. And of course, now, um, following the Trump administration, being pushed out, we now see this, as I said, scrambling to reassert a US foreign policy presence in Africa. And it comes as no surprise, of course, because of the different shifts that we've seen in terms of China's economic and political um, influence, growing political influence across the world. But importantly, and this is where I want to talk about this, and I think this is where Jody and others have been doing excellent work over the last few decades around um, the question of a militarized foreign policy and the way the U.S. operates in, in geopolitics and the world is through coercion and force. And I want to jump back to, I mentioned this yesterday, those who were here in the conversation, but for those who weren't, is in August last year, the US published a new foreign policy strategy document for Africa. It's a 17 page document. And in this document, it features 10 mentions of China and Russia combined, including a pledge to, and I want to quote them, counter harmful foreign actors on the continent. Not once in their document do they talk about sovereignty, not once do they talk about um, supporting an African sovereign development project, not once do they center it on the developments in Africa. So despite, and many US officials have said it before, Blinken himself said it, that he kept saying, repeating this line of Africans are free to choose who their partners are, um, that the U.S. is interested in bolstering development. But if you look at the document and in blatant statements made by Blinken, it unabashedly displays that the U.S. isn't interested in an autonomous relationship with Africa and in Africans pursuing their sovereign development, but they're basically framing it around U.S. hegemonic ambitions to reassert themselves as the main economic competitors on the continent, as well as um, the kind of biggest political influence. And of course, I think this is also underpinned by the fact that since the um, beginning of the war in Ukraine, more and more African leaders have shown a position of abstention or what we would call non-alignment in many UN resolutions and uh, the first UN resolution around condemning Russia, I, almost half the continent abstain showing a policy of we don't want to get involved in another US-led aggression in the world or NATO-led uh, expansion across the world. And two, in the following ones, like um, the resolution on sanctions on Russia, most African leaders have shown a position of non-alignment. And I think this is an important opportunity that I'll talk about um, towards the end of this. But it's just important to say that U.S. foreign policy 
specifically one that's geared towards war, militarism, and control, uh, we have you know 29 permanent U.S. foreign bases in Africa, and this includes a network. It doesn't include a network of 60 outposts and access points. Um, so the continent is has a strong U.S. military foreign project, but this foreign policy based on a military expansionism is fundamentally um, what informs the information warfare which the US is now trying to reconnect and, and re-incite. And we saw this and there was a uh, an act, a bill that was passed called the Competes Act, uh, which the US Senate passed in March of last year, which it says is to address US tech comms, foreign policy, national security, education, a whole range of things. But basically, this is a pledge of $500 million for an agency called the US Agency for Global Media, which is explicitly framed in combat combative and aggressive terms uh, and is most, again, aiming at foreign partners in Africa, not necessarily to assist Africa in its own pursuit of its own interests, but to target the so-called, um, you know, m malign um, forces, which is how they characterized Russia in one of the bills, which that 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 uh, form of legislature, uh, I forget the full name, but it basically would uh, mean that any African uh, nation or country that did any uh, trade with Russian businesses would basically face some form of economic sanctioning or embargo from the U.S., so one is that you can't understand the conversation about China and how we need to battle the propaganda that is false, is inaccurate, is decontextualized, um, and is not sustainable or nor is it helpful in this current moment when we are facing issues of climate change, issues of um, world hunger, issues of endemic poverty, and we need to be producing more platforms for cooperation and collaboration, not competition and aggression. But we can't understand how we then battle those things if we don't understand that the media is fundamentally connected to a foreign military uh, policy, foreign military policy that ultimately is to is aims to retain a U.S economic and political hegemony um, in geopolitics globally. Then the last aspect I just want to briefly talk to before I guess we go back to opening up the discussion is that various um, civil society organizations, media organizations, as I mentioned, have been geared to explicitly undermine, undermine China's development and development cooperation agreements in Africa while promoting US and Western allies as their prime partner. And we saw this in one example I can give us just after the Competes Act was passed, a couple of months later, an independent Zimbabwean journalist basically reported that the US embassy was funding educational workshops that encouraged journalists to target and criticize Chinese investments and Chinese uh, businesses. And the local organization that's involved in the programs um, was called, it's called the, they're always these strange little intermediaries, local intermediaries called, this one was called the Information for Development Trust, which if you go and look up on the National Endowment for Development, uh, their grant site, you will see that the National Endowment for Development, which is a US NGO, but actually a essentially a governmental arm that um, basically has been funding various civil society organizations explicitly to fight against the U.S.'s um, so-called enemies. And this, as I'll say lastly, this is not something new. U.S. media strategy has been developed over decades and one example is the fact that NED itself um, has funded various um, operations. Let's take the example of South Africa, where um, there was a big daily newspaper called the City Press, which was chosen because it was the largest circulating 
um, newspaper among black people. And the US government, these are all documents that have now been declassified, basically was using it not only to, when I, we're saying um, serve its own interests, but also had an explicitly anti-communist campaign. And I want to quote from one of the grant documents that was given to this newspaper so that it could infiltrate and, and, and shape the consciousness of the Black majority in South Africa in the 1980s. I want to read from the grant. Is it, it is hoped that a concrete discussion of democratic values will help counter the strong Marxist campaigns now being used to coerce South African and Blacks in the Black townships, pointing the way to democratic forms of government being desirable and achievable. So an important aspect also of understanding, it's not just simply also about China and China's economic influence, it's that this rise has been facilitated through socialist construction, through a communist politics. And so there is also a historic anti-communist um, push that comes from the US, despite the fact that South Africa is actually home to one of the, to the oldest uh, Communist Party on the continent, the South African Communist Party, which was founded in 1921. It's over 100 years old, and South Africa is no foreigner to uh, a very dynamic left political landscape. But what we're seeing today is almost a, a, a reigniting of this anti communist um, propagandist apparatus, but they're using the same old structures or at least structures that have a roots in these historical processes to reinvigorate them. And I mean, uh, I'll end with the, the one thing that the co-founder of the National Endowment for Development, Alan Weinstein said in the early 1990s that, and I quote, he said, a lot of what we do today was done covertly 25 years ago by the CIA. So his own words, he said this in the 1990s, talking about how the CIA operated in the 70s in Latin America, in Africa, undermining various radical governments. So this is all again to say that a lot of the propaganda that is geared towards, geared against China, has historical foundations in anti-communism, has historical foundations in US hegemony, and largely is undermining a lot of the processes that are happening in Africa, specifically around our sovereignty. But I will say that the mood of African leaders, despite their limitations in terms of serving the interests of their own people on the international stage, there is a little bit of an opening that might allow us to advance an agenda for peace because um, I think a, it was like a couple of months ago at the Munich Security Conference, the Namibian prime minister, for example, uh, when she was asked about the country's decision to abstain from the UN General Assembly's resolution to condemn Russia, she basically said that, and I wanna quote her, we are promoting a peaceful resolution of the conflict so that the entire world and all the resources of the world can be focused on improving the conditions of people around the world instead of being spent on acquiring weapons, killing people, and actually creating hostilities. And she talked about how the, the money could be better that's going into arms could be better served to utilize um, or better served to promote development, not only in Ukraine, in Africa, in Asia, and many parts of the world. And we've also seen the likes of uh, the president of Senegal, Macky Sall, he spoke at the UN General Assembly last year, also saying that we already suffer a historical burden of colonialism. Um, we don't want to be pulled in to support a US hegemonic and coercive interest that doesn't actually serve the peoples of the world. So this is all to say that even though the tentacles of US imperialism um, are rooted in the African continent, a lot of the opportunities that have emerged through the rise of China and its different form of geopolitical collaboration, cooperation, has given us a little bit more confidence in the African continent to make more independent decisions. And though there's still a lot of work to do because of the legacy of xenophobia, anti-communism, um, has still, you know, 
created certain limitations, especially around peoples to peoples um, exchange and, and cooperation. Um, I think we're seeing right now an opening that might give us greater possibilities to build networks that are based on principles of anti-imperialist global solidarity. Mika, thank you very much. That was very uh, illuminating. Uh, I'm just struck by the fact that uh, even with the capacity of the US uh, to engage in such uh, pervasive uh, propaganda that the African nations nevertheless are proving themselves to be more and more uh, impervious uh, to being influenced uh, in this kind of way. Uh, and I know that, that more and more African countries are siding with Russia uh, and with uh, China, uh, the, the BRICS organization, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, uh, that you know, 10 years ago with just four countries now have dozens and dozens of African and Asian countries uh, wanting to join. Um, because the as the United States has been engaging in essentially perpetual war around the world, um, uh, the Chinese have been very skillfully in a very low profile way, uh, developing a completely different framework for international cooperation based on cultural exchange uh, and trade. And I think what we we see is the beginning of a tipping point as more and more countries are seeing uh, the US uh, in Ukraine for exactly what it is, US expansionism, um, uh, understanding uh, that the Russians are standing up to that, are in support of that from a kind of a neo-colonialist point of view because so much of the world has seen this over and over again, and are realizing that this is the moment uh, to really begin to uh, take a stand. Uh, and the, 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 the center of gravity uh, is more and more uh, around China uh, as, it, uh, as, it, as it emerges as a very important and credible counterforce now uh, to what the US uh, is seeking to achieve, and so I would just would love to have your your uh, your sense of what I uh, just said, and also how um, you're viewing the the emergence of China uh, in Africa uh, as a counter uh, to what the United States is doing. Sure, great question, thank you. So as um, many might know, uh, one of the important elements of China's foreign policy approach is um, non-interference um, and kind of respecting the sovereignty of nations' borders, nations' territories, um, as well as uh, their kind of policy frameworks. So in the last few decades, we've seen, you know, China has increased its relationship, signed, you know, memorandums of understanding with various countries. When the Forum on China-Africa cooperation was formed in 2000, there were around 30 something countries. And now almost all African countries are on board and part of that. And what the last 20 years have meant, though it has a longer history in anti-colonial solidarity and struggles, is there's been a strengthening of diplomatic relationships. I think, for example, Africans, their most of their diplomatic visits that they make in the or have made in the last, uh, I think, uh, between 2009 and 2018, so almost 10 years in that time, they made like I think it was almost 200 visits between China and Africa and high level visits. So one is that there's a sense of respect that I mm. think China gives to African leaders that we don't see with US or Western leaders. I'm sure many of you, you recall when, um, when uh, the, the Queen of England died, 
Yes, she did die, right? Um, that wasn't a, a happy yes. dream I had. <laughs> when she died, all the Western leaders were, you know, given private cars and all the African leaders were like bust in on, you know, like a little, not, um, not saying that African leaders should have, or any leaders should have luxury um, transportation, but a lot of African leaders get more respect basically in the diplomatic uh, framework and they get to have high level um, relationships whilst often they've been like junior partners mm -hmm. of the West. So that's one. Two is that even though African leaders are showing, a, and I would say more than anything right now, there's a non-alignment. I want to try to be realistic that no one is coming out like the way Nkrumah or Lumumba or, you know, Thomas Sankara, who talked about debt and said, we shouldn't be paying back any kind of debt because debt is a colonial construct and it's a form of reconquest based on the historical exploitation and a need to resubordinate us because you can't subordinate us through chains. You now have to do it financially. He's talking about this in the 80s. We don't have those voices who are really, you know, speaking truth to power, sadly. And we have to recognize there's a level of opportunism for certain leaders that they benefit from being like, okay, I have two choices, now I can juggle it. But the hope is that now given choices it, within our countries domestically, now we have the opportunity as people's organizations to put pressure for different choices to be made and not to have to always capitulate to the West. And I think that also gives um, working class organizations, trade unions, et cetera, more opportunity to push for an agenda that advances um, the interests of their people. But then lastly, what I was going to say was that um, one of the limitations that we have in the China-Africa relationship is whether it's because of our different, I don't know, epistemological backgrounds or linguistic differences, we still have ways to go in terms of telling our stories. And that's why I'm so grateful that um, Jody is pushing for these kinds of moments and discussions is because I'll say this frankly, sometimes China has suffered from not being able to tell their own stories in a way that's compelling to at least our foreign audiences, international audiences, when they have beautiful, amazing, incredibly powerful, you know, factual um, uh, phenomena that the world would, you know, love to hear. But there's been a bit of a static, monolithic form of sharing their stories that I think undermines the authenticity and strength of, of their experiences. And two, that because of a lack of ownership in Africa of, of media and, you know, most media houses that are owned by local Africans are most of them media moguls who have, you know, are venture capitalists on the side. So they, they're looking for clickbait and everything like that. So we also in Africa need to create more dynamic media platforms where we can create different types of storytelling that is based on solidarity that is based on wanting to understand reality for what it is um because sadly you know the the biggest newspapers in south africa for example the headliner is always some you know tabloid salacious type of thing because they need to sell newspapers so there is ways to go for us in reclaiming space and that's part of the battle of ideas yes now just one quick uh follow-up question and then Jody, want to invite you to make any uh, comments you would like. And that is, you spoke of the National Endowment for Development. Is that the, different than the National Endowment for Democracy? Are they two separate organizations? Because I know about the NED, the National Endowment for Democracy, you know, they spent $5 billion uh, uh, developing the Maidan revolution in uh, Ukraine, the so-called orange uh, revolution. And we're working uh, hand in glove with the CIA and Joe Biden in the White House to overthrow the, the then existing uh, regime in Ukraine uh, and bring in uh, an anti-Russian pro-NATO uh, government as was discussed by Victoria Nuland uh, 
uh, on YouTube, as it turned out. Uh, and so the, the, the National Endowment for Democracy has been uh, working all over the world in, in undermining democracy uh, in order to, to serve the, uh, the uh, foreign policy interests of the United States. Uh, but I didn't know so much about the National Endowment for Development. Is, no, 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 is sorry. It is democracy. It, it was, a. Uh... <laughs> It, it is the same organization as the National Endowment for yeah. Democracy. Yeah, they, yeah, that's what I thought. Apologies, it was just a slip because, you know, a lot of these words have been hollowed out through these, you know, the NGOization of politics where democracy development, none of them mean anything, you know. So that was my 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 mistake. Same Same group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's consistent with what I was saying earlier and with, with Jody that the most effective propaganda is when you literally turn the truth on its head. So the National Endowment for Democracy, you think, oh, wow, the US government is supporting democracy. And that's what they say. But what they're actually doing is subverting democracy uh, in an orchestrated way with US military and intelligence agencies in order to um, get local groups or government changes or coup d'etats or electoral manipulation uh, to uh, eliminate democracy um, uh, so that they can actually be um, useful uh, tools of uh, U.S. military and corporate uh, interests. So I just wanted to make sure that we were both talking about the same organization uh, because the NED is is infamous around the world for as an example of how you turn truth on its head uh, and under the guise of truth, you're engaging in all kinds of systematic uh, falsehood. Uh, but Jody, why don't you come in uh, at this point and make whatever comments you would like, and then I know you have some additional things that you want to say about propaganda as well. For Mika, just two things I'd love you to share, um, because I, I think it's an example of the ignorance, um, you know, in U.S. intelligence, but um, it, you could do this better than me. I only know, like, the, the thin veil of it, but the fact that the um, ANC leader of Africa, um, you know, that the U.S. thought they owned... <laughs> Um, and, you know, like it had a very uh, ownership type feeling around um, this, you know, has been very vocal around. And I know we're getting off of China, but I think this is a good example of how you were talking about the um, the actual relationships getting in the way of the propaganda. And I think this is an important piece. But historically, why is South Africa an, an ANC leader so much closer to Russia than the United States? Because I think that also has to do with relationship. And then um, I'd love you to share that story of our friend from Zambia about the, the visit of the, um, the vice president of the United States. If you could just share those two things, because I think when we're looking at this, it's, it's that, you know, what you started with, Jim, it's like if, if we can disrupt your actual humanity if we can take you away from relationship and put you in lies it, we control you in that lie zone instead of the place where actual common sense and your guidance is so i think those are two good examples sure um so as you said in terms of relationships What I think the U.S. has a very short-term memory, honestly. <laughs> U.S. is suffering from serious short-term memory loss because when it comes to, you know, we have lived fewer years free than the years of colonialism, right? And so for many, our anti-imperialist, anti-colonial partners like Russia, like China, it means a lot to us. The Soviet Union, as early as you know, the 1930s was providing education, political training, 
uh, various forms of solidarity and support on how to think and organize our way out of colonialism. So the SACP, as I mentioned, who was part of also uh, the kind of alliance with the ANC in the fight against um, colonialism and apartheid, many of them were formed through their relationship with the Soviet Union and how the Soviet Union um, helped to support various national liberation projects and processes across the continent. So one is that we have, yeah, these historical relationships that you can't just be, and they have shifted like in the 2000s, I mean, after the, sadly, after the fall of the Soviet Union, um, there was a, as, as you all well know, there was a, a, very, a period of where, where it, a lot of international relationships suffered because the political and economic project um, was at an all time low in, in what became Russia. Uh, but one is that I think not only do we think about our historical relationships, we have to understand it in terms of the bulwark against imperialism, because I think some people are characterizing these relationships almost nepotistically, like, well, you're going to stick with your family. But in fact, it's about thinking about what are our true enemies versus those, you know, uh, conflicts we might have between different states or differences of opinion versus what is the true enemy of progress what is the true enemy of humanity and that's u.s imperialism and so i think that having that kind of long view and broader view is what has uh, enabled these relationships to continue then the other as you said what the anecdote i wanted to share is that i think we're in a moment in which if we work really hard, we can push towards the, you know, I want to say the right side of history, I mean the left side of history, um, but where history will absolve us, as, as uh, Fidel Castro said, because it's more and more clear what the priorities of the U.S. is versus what the priorities of those who truly support the global South is. And the anecdote that I shared yesterday was that when... Kamala Harris went to visit uh, Tanzania, part of her, I think it was three or four countries, Ghana was one of them, her trip to, to Africa was. When she went to Tanzania, she went and visited the memorial of the um, US embassy bombing in 1998. The US embassy was bombed in 1998 uh, by groups who uh, associate themselves with um, extremist groups, but who, had done so because of the huge US push to destroy the Middle East and to recapture the oil states essentially for their own you know, economic interests. And so that Kamala Harris going there of all places was to honor the kind of US's um, a supposed moral higher ground that it always punts across the world, that it somehow has the better ethical position when it does not. And B, is a distortion of what the priorities of African people are. On the other hand, when um, the last Chinese high-level visit that went to that region went to a memorial in uh, Zambia of the Tanzania-Zambia railway line, which was constructed between 1968 and 1975, constructed and financed by the Chinese government at a time in which they had very limited resources for any kind of foreign development projects. They had over 50,000 um, Chinese workers and engineers who throughout the period in total um, were working there. They built you know, thousands of miles of railway, all in you know, relatively um, labor intensive processes, not the same kind of machinery and technology we have today, and I think it was at least 160 Chinese workers died in the process because they had to go through mountains, through rivers, like very intensive work. And so when China comes to the continent, they go and honor the labor and the value added by ordinary working class people and the collaboration between workers of Africa and China. Whilst the US goes to honor its kind of moralization of its war efforts around the world. 
And I think that that perspective is something that we need to be clear about, that they, the US offers a very different foreign policy perspective from China and many others. Thank you, Mika. Thank you for um, expanding our consciousness again today and all you do to um, elevate and escalate our hearts and minds uh, into peace instead of warmongering and serving the people. So thank you so much. Deepest gratitude. Thank you so much for opening up this platform. And if anyone is interested in more of these kinds of conversations, debates, I host a podcast called the Crane and Africa China podcast, as well as Tricontinental and all the other groups that I work with, No Cold War, Dongsheng, offer various materials for you to see the facts and make up your own mind. Thank you, yes. Mika, so much. I know you have to uh, go to another meeting now. Uh, but uh, we hope to have you back. You're a gold mine of, of important information. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Jody, so, what um, uh, additional comments would you like to make? <laughs> well, um, I, I had wanted to um, show uh, a professor um, from Taiwan that could take us into, uh, you know, a deeper look of like the how Taiwan is being used in this as a propaganda for this war on China. But um, we're, we're kind of late in, in the program. So I, I wanna go back um, and really, you know, look at propaganda um, over the last 70 years. Um, because I think when you, you know, like with Mika, if you can ground it in like what's true, then it kind of helps you understand what's happening now. And so as I was able to look at what was happening in the propaganda towards China, I was looking through my lens of what I had seen happen with Iraq. And one thing that doesn't happen in the United States is, is the experience of the cost of war. And they say that one of the ways that the war was able to end in Vietnam was you know, Life Magazine's photographers sharing with us that actual human cost of war. We don't get that. And they knew it was wrong to show it because it would upset people. So during the Iraq war, <clears throat> sorry. During the Iraq war, you were not allowed to see caskets coming home. Those soldiers that gave their lives, that everyone says they honor and celebrate, were not even allowed to be honored coming home. They were taken out the baggage side. People who were wounded were not allowed to share their stories. I had to make a movie about them so people could see what that really looked like. So we know the war, the lies that took us to the war in Iraq. We know there were no WMDs, but we knew that before the war. We knew that Colin Powell lied to the world, but we knew that before the war. We knew that from the White House, they were lying about weapons of mass destruction and, and Ukrainian cakes because it got exposed by uh, uh, an ambassador, his wife got out it as a CIA agent, and someone in the White House had to go to jail about it. So it's just like, it's all so visible. The head of the inspectors spoke passionately every day, saying there are no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. He was the head of inspection for the UN. But the media wouldn't carry it. So I just want to, you know, remind us, take us back to our capacity to think about this. The Gulf of Tonks, Tonkin incident did not happen in 1964, but it was an excuse for millions of deaths. It was a lie. The U.S. claimed that the North Vietnamese boats like attacked a destroyer in international waters that justified retaliation. 
you know, and as Mika was saying, this was about stopping communism. Think of the McCarthy committee in Congress. We have another one in Congress right now. It's, it's the first ever committee in Congress attacking a country, the party, not the country, the communist, the Chinese Communist Party. You know, it's just reminding everyone that communism is about equality. Communism is for the workers. It's like it, people pretend like it's a violence, which democracy, the United States democracy is. So when Jim talks about it's the opposite um, and that we lost that war, we lost the Iraq war, but the peop the, the, the people lose it. The, the taxpayers of the United States lose it, but the rich and the weapons manufacturers win. So Operation Urgent Fury in Granada in 1983, an invasion of Granada, that was justified claiming that American citizens were at, at, at risk. I mean, an insane Granada. Why? Because, oh my God, it could become Cuba. So destroyed, destroyed. I mean, I know so many people who had friends there that died. A literal destruction of innocent people. The Panama invasion in 1989, lies, total lies, so the United States could control the Panama Canal. The Kosovo intervention by NATO was about the expansion of NATO. It was, a, it was speak to anyone in the Balkans, that was a violence. That is more trauma than they experienced in the whole war. The invasion of Afghanistan, we knew then, we know now, that the Taliban had offered up Osama bin Laden. They had offered him up, but instead we invaded Afghanistan. If you are a woman in Afghanistan right now, that is a horror. That is a horror. And I also want to bring it back to Obama. I went to Afghanistan in 2009 when he became president and I brought back 4,000 signatures from the women in Afghanistan. And I brought back stories. I brought back stories of the women who were members of the parliament in Afghanistan, begging not to do the escalation on Afghanistan. Afghanistan had been ignored by Bush. He had moved to Iraq. And what had happened in those years is that Afghanistan was healing from the invasion. And the Taliban was being reintegrated and peace was happening. And it was, it was lovely. And then the escalation. What war does is it rips apart the fabric of society. Iraq is destroyed from what it was, the beautiful culture that it was. I think it's like 7 million people are refugees out of Iraq. So it's it becomes a rich the rich and the and those educated leave, and you leave it to, you know, a chaos run by gangs. It continues to be a hotbed of violence. We leave behind hell. I you know Libya, that was a lie. I mean that what they did to demonize Gaddafi, who like in Iraq, I wanna say like in Iraq, it was, it's a socialist country. People, everyone had housing, everyone had food, everyone had healthcare, everyone had education. But we were fed lies. And what that bombing of Libya has done to North Africa, to the, the weaponizing, of the Middle East by people with no, no relationship to power, but the taking down of power. It has destroyed whole communities, it has destroyed Mali. We need to understand the cost of these lies. We're talking about propaganda, but I want you to understand 
what it means and what it does. That there's somehow we, we talk about the word propaganda and lies and hate, but we don't understand these insidious, violent roots that, you know, they're used for. And we're, our hearts and minds are weaponized. That's a violence. And we continue to allow it. And so, you know, as we finish this day on propaganda, I want everyone to really feel into what that is, that this country, what it has done. I mean, I didn't even go back to the bombing of Iraq, you know, when it was about Kuwait, which was also a lie and it was driven by an ambassador in Kuwait who lied. And all those, you know, yellow ribbons around trees that that inside of all of us in the United States is a is a, a, a desire. I want to say there's a desire for violence at the core of this country is slavery and genocide and a continued investment and love of violence that people mostly poor people, mostly people of color around the world have been the victim of. And those that continue to speak out against war have witnessed it, have felt it, have known it, and they wouldn't want that to happen to any of you because it's something you don't get over. And so as we have these conversations I want us to remember what it's about I mean I talk to women in Ukraine now and they're hiding their husbands and their brothers and their sons and their fathers that all the men are have to go to the front lines and that we just you know Jim can tell the story about um a POW in, in Russia from Ukraine talking about not even knowing how to fire a weapon and being put on the front lines and seeing his fellow Ukrainians, you know, mowed down in less than six hours. That's a brutality that we in the 21st century should know is wrong. We should know by now. We knew a hundred years ago when, when, you know, it's like, what is wrong with us that we can be sucked in by this manipulation, by this propaganda? You know, let's reflect on our own selves about what are those things that they, that have been implanted in our and us that allow us that 65% of our tax dollars are used for weapons. That tomorrow you're going to hear from someone who, who, can say this better than me, but it's China knows it loses in war. And we heard from Mika, African leaders know they lose in war. Why do Americans not know they lose in war? Because we're not, we don't review what has been lost. We're not looking at the fabric of our society. We're not even looking at ourselves as warmongers or the violence that we perpetrate around the world, calling it democracy, a word that others in the world don't trust because of the violence it wrecks. So I wanted this day in the middle to be about propaganda because it's a weapon and it's a weapon that we get used by and we become the violence. And I think it's important for everyone to get that that not to be someone advocating for peace is to be used by the violence. And um, this week we're launching uh, a new initiative at Code Pink um, after my week in Congress um, a couple of weeks ago, where the, basically every member of Congress said, well, all I hear from are weapons manufacturers in the Pentagon. I don't hear from the people. I don't hear a call for peace. So we're launching a summer of peace, asking everyone in every way they know how to raise up peace and make it visible.
I mean, whether you paint a peace sign on your fence or hang it in your window, or I hope that as a first act, you do that. And as a second act, you join our calls for Congress every day, or you, you organize people locally and engage in a peace march through your local um, farmer's market. It's been drowned out. It's been, as members of Congress told me, you get buzzsawed when you talk about peace. Think about that. A member of Congress can't talk about peace because they are literally buzzsawed by everyone around them. It's not safe to say peace. We've got to make it, you, the citizens have to make it safe again and important again to ask and call for peace because we're lost. We're very lost and we need to know that. So I, I thank you for coming and learning and sharing. Um, I want to say, you know, someone mentioned earlier about the Holy Roman Empire as the biggest owner of property, but this week we're also launching a, an ad um, in Sojourners and in um, the Catholic Worker that um, features the Pope. I want to say he's one of the biggest voices for peace in the in the world right now. He has called for diplomacy for an end to this war and for the United States and China to be friends, to be working for the planet. He's speaking for the planet and for the people. I think we all need to be speaking for the planet and the people because we live in a time in history where this is about nuclear war and Russia's already there. We know, you know, as I, Jim said earlier in the week, we cannot push anyone that owns nuclear weapons to a place where they have to choose them. That is wrong. And what we heard in Congress is we need peace voices. So come to Code Pink, we'll support you. We'll give you things you can hang in your window. We'll give you talking points. You can join us every day as we call Congress. But they, we need peace has got to get loud. So join us and thank you. Uh, Jody, that was, that was masterful. That was just simply a masterful expression from a deep heart. So I just want to thank you for all you do and uh, to appeal to all of us out there uh, to do whatever we can to make peace a word that is honored and a pathway that is uh, trodden uh, as we move uh, into the future. And I think what you just said is a beautiful way to close out our session for today. Uh, so I wanna thank, thank you uh, very, very deeply for everything that you and Code Pink are doing. You're really literally on the front lines of the most critical issue in the world. And I just wanna salute you and honor you and your organization. Uh, I think all of us uh, need to just think about what Jody just said, everyone. So we're going to close this session out. And I hope that we ponder deeply uh, her words. And we'll convene again tomorrow uh, for a deeper dive into some of these complexities uh, and the realities that we need to honor about the great civilization uh, that is China. Thank well, you, everyone. Tomorrow, I'm really excited. And just so everyone knows, we have two Asian Americans, uh, one from the West Coast and one from the East Coast, to tell you what it's like the hate on China for them here. And to, you know, to hear from, you know, this is, it's not about over there. It's happening right here. The, casu the casualties of this war have already happened, and they're Asian Americans in the United States. So um, I just invite you to two amazing people, one's a judge, one's a professor, um, to get an insight into the, your own country and what's happening. That's tomorrow on Humanity Rising, day four of our five-day program on China is not our enemy. Thank you, Jody. Thank you, Mika. We'll see everybody tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.